Correct. Okay, is everybody seeing a nice stylized fish picture? Good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for having me, um, and, and thanks for inviting Conservation Fisheries to talk about what we do. Um, like Jessica said, we've got we've been here since 1986, uh, which is a pretty long time for an on the ground conservation organization like we are. It's uh, it's hard to keep that momentum going. I'm sure Wild Virginia's had the same experience over the years. But um, my title of my talk is a generational effort. And this work started with J.R. Shute and Patrick Rakes, who are our founders, uh, when they were graduate students in the 1980s. So it's uh, gone on for 40 years. Uh, the work is not ending. We still have a lot of fish to work with. And we're looking to set up a foundation for conservation fisheries to do our work for the next 40 years. Um, one of the things I like to do with these talks is start with endangered species and what you think of when you think of endangered species. So if we were in person, I'd say close your eyes and think of the first endangered species that comes to your mind. Um, it might be African elephants, big charismatic animals. Uh, baby elephants are extremely cute. It's easy to get invested in saving elephants. Uh, they're amazing, intelligent creatures. They live a long time. They're keystone species in the environment. Uh, so they're super important to how the world works in their environment. Um, some of you might've thought of the great apes, the human primates that are so similar to us. Uh, easy to get invested in something that looks like us, uh, acts like us. And these are species that uh, people really want to save. You might have thought of bald eagles, uh, a success story for the Endangered Species Act. The national symbol uh, saved from near extinction by the Endangered Species Act, but also by a raft of other environmental regulations that were passed around the same time. Uh, the Clean Water Act went a long way toward cleaning up our rivers and streams. The Clean Air Act had indirect effects on our rivers and streams by removing airborne pollutants. And we've seen huge uh, changes for the positive in the environment as a result of all of that foundational um, legislation that was passed in the late 60s, early 70s. The National Environmental Policy Act that requires federal agencies to evaluate the impacts of their own actions and of actions that they permit as part of their statutory authorities. Um, some of you may have thought of fish, uh, maybe not this fish. Um, I'll talk about the snail darter, which is kind of the iconic endangered fish species in a minute. But this is a very important fish to the history of conservation fisheries. Uh, this is the smoky mad tom. And it was discovered in the 1980s and described by a researcher as an extinct species. Um, this is one of a group of about 30 miniature catfishes. They don't get more than three and a half or four inches long at maturity. Some of the biggest mad tom catfishes are maybe seven or eight, so they're not giants, and they're often an overlooked part of our environment. Um, this particular fish, the smoky mad tom, used to occur in Abrams Creek in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, as part of a trout, trophy trout project, everything from Abrams Falls downstream to the Little Tennessee River was poisoned out in 1957 in an effort to produce a trophy trout fishery. Um, looking back on that from our perspective in 2023, that was a really bad idea. Um, in 1957, it was state-of-the-art fishery science. Get rid of what they termed the rough fish, so the trout had no competitors for food. Um, the term biodiversity hadn't even been invented. It wouldn't be invented until the 1980s. So in some places, mistakes were made with reasonably good intentions. It had dramatic consequences for the Smoky Mad Tom. Uh, when Taylor was looking through museum lots of specimens that were preserved from that trout, um, 
restoration event. They call it restoration. It wasn't. There are uh, non-native species that were put there. But he saw a fish in that jar that was unknown to science and described it as the smoky mad tom. Um, fast forward to the 1980s, we have some researchers from the University of Tennessee in David Etnire's lab, uh, David Etnire of the famous snail darter controversy. Um, we're out in nearby Sitico Creek, just looking for fish, looking for a research project, and they found smoky mad toms. Um, at that point, nobody had ever tried to reintroduce non-native fish to a stream where they'd been eliminated. So David Etnire asked his grad students, Pat and JR, who he knew kept aquariums, which was a little bit unusual for uh, ichthyologists at the time. For most ichthyologists, the idea was collect as many fish as you can, preserve them, take them back to the lab and study them. Uh, very few people kept fish alive as part of their research, but Pat and JR did. So Pat and I asked them if they thought they could propagate this fish in the lab and reintroduce it back into Abrams Creek where it had been eliminated. Um, another fish, the yellowfin mad tom, was also discovered in Sitico Creek at about the same time, and it became the second species that conservation fisheries started working with. Um, this grew until now we've worked with 83 species, I think the last count, over the last 36, 37 years that we've been in existence. So this little fish is important. Um, it's not as charismatic as an elephant or a bald eagle, but they're very important to the ecosystem that they live in, and they're part of a community that was eliminated from Abrams Creek. Um, only about half of the 60 or so species of fish that were wiped out from that reach of the river were able to return on their own. So not only was the Smoky Mad Tom eliminated, a lot of other fish were eliminated too. But this little guy is the genesis of what we do. Uh, we still work with the fish today. It's still considered endangered because it's so limited in its distribution, but it's much more secure because of the efforts of conservation fisheries and our partners with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the park, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, the Cherokee National Forest. It takes a uh, community to do these recovery efforts. The fish that you might have thought of when I asked you to think of a fish that's endangered is the snail darter. Um, this is a snail darter from the French Broad River. This fish was one of the first tests of the newly minted Endangered Species Act. Uh, Dr. Etnire found this fish in the Little Tennessee River in 1975 just before the Tennessee Valley Authority was about to close Teleco Dam and flood the only known habitat for this fish. Um, the Teleco Dam was a fairly controversial project anyway. Uh, there are a lot of people against it. The Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, tribal homelands were there. The town of Tennessee, which gives Persina Tennessee, the snail darter, the state of Tennessee and the Tennessee River its name would be flooded by completion of Teleco Dam. A lot of farmers would be displaced. Uh, it was one of the best trout fisheries in the region. So there were a lot of reasons for people to oppose this. And, and the fact that TVA probably just didn't need another dam. The snail darter proved to be a really potent weapon in the hands of people who were opposing this dam. Uh, the ESA was sort of an untried law and people took the snail darter and championed it as a challenge to the Teleco Dam project. It resulted in a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this case was argued before the Supreme Court. Nobody thought the Endangered Species Act was a strong enough law to override Tennessee Valley Authority and all the political weight behind it. The Supreme Court ruled for the snail darter. Um, it was an amazing victory for these this newly minted environmental law. Uh, I guess it was five years since it was written, but the challenge started a couple of years after. And the law was actually revised to provide an exemption clause that allowed 
the action agency, in this case TVA, to argue that their project was more important than the species that they were dealing with. And they formed what they called a God committee, which is a lot of cabinet level officials, uh, representatives from any states that are affected by the projects. This issue was put before that God committee. The committee ruled unanimous, unanimously for the snail darter. So the Endangered Species Act proved to be a really potent um, tool to help conservationists protect species and the habitats that they live in. Unfortunately, with this particular case and Teleco Dam, TVA had some political friends in Congress who wrote an exemption for Teleco Dam to the Endangered Species Act. So it was exempted from compliance with that act. The dam was completed. Teleco Reservoir sits there today. Um, in the meantime, between 1975 and 79, when that exemption was written, TVA biologists, to their credit, um, Fish and Wildlife Service biologists, other interested parties, the University of Tennessee and Dave Etnier, had transplanted this fish into several other streams, and some additional research had found them in other places. So the snail darter survived, but they lost the core, the most important part of their habitat. Um, I call this one a Qualified Endangered Species Act success story. Um, this is my hand holding a snail darter from the main stem of the Tennessee River. Uh, we found out that over the years they were able to make their way in the main stem of the river and survive. They weren't in Teleco River anymore, Teleco Dam, the Little Tennessee River, but they found other places they could survive. And over the years, let me get my laser pointer. Over the years, they spread from their original population in the Little Tennessee River and just below Fort Loudoun Reservoir. They were transplanted to the Holston and French Broad River, the Hiawatsee River. They were later found in North and South Chickamauga Creek. And in later years, uh, we think due to a lot of positive improvements in the way that TVA operates their system of reservoirs and dams, they were able to spread down into the Faint Rock system, the Elk River system, and all the way into Mississippi and Bear Creek. So this species was able to survive that particular impact. They probably wouldn't have been if the Endangered Species Act hadn't been there driving a lot of conservation efforts. So even if the dam wasn't stopped, the species was saved. In 2002, November, um, I guess about a year ago now, the snail darter was officially removed from the endangered species list. And on the left over here is Dr. David Etnier, the describer of the snail darter and a personal hero of mine. Um, he introduced me to freshwater fish when I was a freshman at the University of Tennessee and went on to be my graduate uh, student mentor and a good friend. Um, Etz got to see this fish come off the list, which is a huge uh, victory for what the Endangered Species Act is supposed to do. However, it took 47 years from that 1975 description and listing to removing the fish from the endangered species list. That's uh, a long time. And that's why I say this kind of effort is generational. Um, we're going to have to rely on these guys. This is the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, Martha Williams, and a budding, I hope, conservation biologist releasing yellowfin mad toms into this river. I mentioned the yellowfin earlier um, with Sitico and Abrams Creek. This is a species that CFI has been working with since we started in 86. If we establish fish in the French Broad River, where these fish were reintroduced last year, will be the last piece in the puzzle that will allow us to petition the Fish and Wildlife Service to remove the yellowfin mad tom from the list. So snail darter was the first fish east of the Mississippi to re be removed from the endangered species list because of recovery. We would love to see another one of our fish, the yellowfin mad tom, be the second one to come off of that list. And again, I call it a qualified success because if you look at this distribution in the river, 
these gaps are dams and reservoirs. And every one of these populations is separated by a reservoir. They're able to drift down and travel downstream through the reservoirs, but those dams are maybe always going to be there and always going to be a problem for this fish. So this fish's survival depends still on good behavior by the Tennessee Valley Authority and by all of the other actors that work along the Tennessee River. I would love to see unqualified successes. We have species that are recovered and don't depend on human activity to keep them around. <clears throat> um, fish still have problems. I talked about the Clean Water Act being a great piece of legislation. It removed a lot of point source pollution, uh, bad sewage treatment plants, industrial discharges to the river, um, other things that were pollution from one specific source. What's eating away at our rivers now is non-point source pollution. Uh, the biggest impact for fish that we work with is just dirt, sediment. Um, and it can be clean, perfectly uncontaminated dirt that causes problems with these animals. A lot of the fish that we work with are bottom dwelling or depend on clean substrates at the bottom of the river for their lifestyle, their feeding, and particularly for their spawning. Um, one of the greatest threats to aquatic animals is a terrestrial animal, cattle. Uh, cattle in many, many places across the country are allowed unrestricted access to the rivers. They cause bacterial contamination. They cause uh, disruption of the riparian zone, so more sediment gets into the streams. And we continue to see kind of a death of a thousand cuts in many of our rivers, and it's not those big impacts anymore. It's many, many smaller impacts. And construction, uh, I think that's one of the issues that you all look at is compliance with construction. The best management practices is so important. If you put up a silt screen, but don't maintain it, you might as well not have a silt screen there. So a lot of our regulators need some pressure uh, to be sure that they're keeping on top of the people who are potentially impacting our streams. So the streams, the impacts have gotten a lot more diffuse over the years, but they're still out there. Um, there has been a lot of recovery. We see so many streams that are recovered to the point that we can start putting fish back into them as part of our work. But it takes a lot of effort by a lot of organizations and a lot of agencies to get those streams to the point where raising a fish in captivity and introducing it back into the wild is even a a potential. I mentioned dams with TVA before. Uh, impoundments are everywhere across the U.S. And for a two or three inch fish that lives on the bottom, this is an impossible barrier to cross. Um, this is, I believe, Calderwood Dam on the Little Tennessee River, again, where Teleco is just farther upstream. I looked at the dam inventories across the states, and it looks like Virginia has something around 21,000 dams, uh, low-head dams, hydropower dams, municipal water supply dams. That's a lot of barriers in Virginia streams. To the credit of Virginia, 64 removals have occurred over the years, and about 8,500 miles of stream have been reconnected. So that's a huge change in the condition of those rivers and gives us a big opportunity to recover some of these species. Tennessee, where Conservation Fisheries is located, doesn't have that many dams. We have about 8,700, but we've only had 32 dam removals and only about 2,500 miles of river reconnected. We have a long way to go. We're talking tens of thousands of miles of river affected by dams that are big and small. And this has an impact on the species. Uh, they're fragmented, they're isolated for mothers of their kind, and it makes it really hard for those populations to persist over time. So how do you recover a rare species? We like to say habitat, habitat, habitat. Um, species cannot survive unless they have the right habitat to live in, to feed in, to spawn in, 
just to exist. So habitat protection is always best. Let's not mess it up in the first place. Um, with a lot of our streams that have been impacted for centuries and are seeing the benefits of the Clean Water Act and stormwater rules and a lot of positive change, habitat restoration is possible. Dam removals are a form of habitat restoration. So if there's no habitat, there can't be the possibility of recovery. So we need to prevent impacts to that habitat. We need to restore habitat where we can. And then we can talk about putting fish back into those areas where they may have been eliminated. And putting fish in the river is as simple as stocking. If you think about trout stocking, uh, what we do is very similar, but on a much smaller scale, where you can have a rainbow trout produce several thousand eggs. These little mad tom catfishes that we're working with produce 30 to 75 eggs per season. So it's a very, very slow process. Um, we can't produce enough fish to have like a one-shot recovery. We have to do repeated stockings over many years to get our fish to get established and get population levels up to the point where they can recover. With a lot of common species that we work with, um, we can just do simple translocation. Catch a bunch of fish from one stream, transport them to a stream that's recovered and let them go about their business. Um, Translocation's easy when you're talking about common species. There are a lot of them removing several hundred or a thousand fish from a population is not gonna adversely affect the population. When you've got an endangered species like the yellowfin mad tom or the spot fin chub here, um, removing just a few individuals from that population might have a really serious adverse effect. And you're actually causing more harm than good by trying to translocate a bunch of animals from one stream to another. You might have an unsuccessful reintroduction and push your native population to the point where it winks out too. So that's where CFI's idea of captive propagation came in. And we wanted to work with some of the rarest of the rare North American fishes, uh, these mad tom catfishes, and try to propagate them in our facility and put them back where they belong on the landscape. So propagation can be used in a variety of ways, reintroductions like I've been talking about, if we can reestablish uh, extirpated populations of these fish, then we can push that fish toward recovery and delisting from the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the worst case scenario that we deal with is when we put together what we call assurance colonies or ARC colonies. This is when the fish are struggling to survive out on the landscape. Uh, one of the fish that Pat Rakes worked with in his grad school days was the Barron's top metal. It lives only on the Barron's Plateau in Middle Tennessee kind of where the Duck River and the Elk River and the Caney Fork River headwaters come together. Um, that fish is a spring endemic. It only lives in spring outfalls and spring runs in those areas. And it needs vegetation uh, to lay its eggs and survive. One of the things that's happened over the years on the Barrens Plateau is it's been developed as a sod farm area and for commercial nurseries. Both of those operations require a lot of groundwater. So um, operations on the Barrens Plateau have started pumping millions of gallons a day of water out onto the land to water these sod farms and water the nurseries. They're robbing it from the groundwater and some of the springs are at much lower flows or even running dry as a result of that groundwater um, withdrawal. The second strike for the Barrens Top Minnow is the droughts that we've been seeing. Uh, climate change is real, folks. <laughs> uh, we are seeing much more frequent drought conditions and much more prolonged drought conditions. And some of the springs that these fish live in are, have gone dry uh, multiple times in the last 10 years. That's a huge change in how the whole system of streams works if the groundwater isn't flowing. The third strike against these Barents top minnows is the introduction of a native North American species that's been moved out of its natural habitat. Uh, the Western mosquito fish 
that the name implies that they eat mosquitoes and they were marketed as mosquito control uh, by a lot of state agencies and federal agencies. Um, they're not that good at eating mosquitoes. What they are really good at is eating the eggs and the fry of native American freshwater fishes uh, that they're not naturally occurring with. So everywhere that that fish has been introduced, the Barron's top minnow has been reduced in numbers and some of those populations only exist in captivity. Uh, CFI maintains these assurance colonies, but we also work with the Tennessee Aquarium down in Chattanooga and the several of the national fish hatcheries that are located in Tennessee. But if we weren't doing that kind of work, this fish would be winking out on the landscape. We're hoping to hold those colonies until we can correct the problems, eliminate the fish, get the groundwater flowing again, and put them back where they belong. But that's kind of where we don't want to be with our conservation work. We want to be actively restoring populations, not trying desperately to prevent the extinction of a species. Uh, life history research is something that's really important. Uh, most of these fish, there are about 750 native fishes in North America. Uh, a little over 100 of those are rare, threatened, or endangered, uh, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And closer to 60% of those are rare or uncommon in parts of their range within the states. So freshwater fish, freshwater mussels, freshwater snails are really threatened by a lot of changes to the environment. Um, we've probably lost, well, we know that we've lost one species of sucker uh, since people were, sucker fish, since people were recording species in the valley. We may have lost the Chucky Mad Tom, another one of these Mad Tom species, and the Slender Chub, uh, which occurred in the Clinch River and the Powell River in Tennessee and Virginia. So we're losing some of these species, and we can't do enough to save them. Some of them are so rare that nobody knows what the life history is. So if we can get them into our facility, we can find out what those habitat requirements are, particularly spawning requirements, and work to save them. Uh, toxicity tolerance is another thing. These fish are canaries in the coal mine. They are much more susceptible to some substances out there in the world than the more common fish are. Uh, we found that out with blue shiners, the fish that we were working with in the Conestoga River with Georgia. Um, they had disappeared from a reach of the river below a sewage treatment plant. And we presumed that there was something going on with the sewage treatment, but all of the toxicity testing that they conducted on fathead minnows, which is a fairly common fish that's used in toxicity testing, wasn't showing any lethal effects to these fish. So we proposed the idea of raising the species that was missing, uh, raise young of blue shiners and use them for toxicity testing because we needed to figure out what was going on and try to recover this reach of the river. It turns out that the blue shiners are an order of magnitude or two more sensitive to chlorine compounds which are used as an antibacterial and finishing process in wastewater treatment plants. Once we realized that, uh, the state was able to go to that treatment plant, get them to convert over to ozone treatment as a final treatment, which is just as effective as an antibacterial. It doesn't put chlorine compounds into the river and these fish bounce back. They were able to reclaim those areas once that impact was removed. But if we hadn't had toxicity information on that specific really rare fish, uh, they never would have known to make those changes. And another thing that's really interesting about our freshwater fish is our freshwater mussel fauna. Uh, there are probably 250 species of freshwater mussels in North America. They're one of the most imperiled groups of organisms on the planet. And every single one of our native freshwater mussels requires a fish as a host, as part of its life cycle. The, they attach to a fish's gills or skin or fin rays, travel around on the fish for a while and then drop off as part of their development. And it's very specific. Sometimes it's only one species of fish is a suitable host for one species of freshwater mussel. 
So if you lose the host fish, you eventually lose the mussel. Uh, a lot of the fish that we have raised are good mussel hosts, and we actually work cooperatively with other hatcheries that are doing mussel uh, recovery work. And we provide individuals to serve as host fish for some of those rarest of the rare mussels. Some of you may have gone to a big fish hatchery uh, and seen brown trout or rainbow trout being raised in huge runs and vats and acres of ponds outside. Um, we're a little bit more humble facility. This is our building in Knoxville, uh, the CFI World Headquarters, our propagation facility. I think somebody described it as the messiest aquarium store I've ever been in. Uh, we house all of our fish in small, uh, recirculating systems or independent tanks. I think we had at last count about 850 tanks in our building with 2,000, 20,000 gallons of water. Um, right now, you can see this block of tanks will have one species in a system. And right now we have 15 species in the building and are working with 19 different populations of those species. Um, our building's about 5,200 square feet, so we're extremely space limited, but there's so much need, so many species that we need to be working with that we cram them in and get the work done anyway. Um, right now we have eight full-time staff, an amazing crew of biologists who devote their time 365 days of the year to work with these fish. Uh, the fish don't take vacations and they don't do holidays. So somebody is always in our building taking care of these animals. And whether it's our staff folks or the amazing crew of volunteers that we have working for us, I think since uh, the beginning of the year, this year, 2023, we've had 15 volunteers come in and out of the building. Uh, those volunteers range from high school students to university students at the local University of Tennessee and Maryville College. Uh, this year, we had our first international intern, um, a student from a university in England contact, contacted us and asked if we hosted international interns. Uh, we hadn't before, and we decided to see if we could make it work. And Christo turned out to be one of the best uh, workers we've ever had in our facility. And he's taking his experience back to England and wanting to talk to people about doing similar things over in England to what we do. So we're trying to spread our message and spread our knowledge as much as we can. We also work with a lot of the state and federal fish hatcheries that are out there, uh, teaching them our techniques. What works with a trout doesn't work with a mad tom catfish. So it's uh, important to learn the particulars of all of these different species in order to be successful. I mentioned our Smoky Mad Tom, the fish that was described as extinct and later found again, and the Yellowfin Mad Tom. Uh, these are sort of our two original species. This is how conservation fisheries started. And one of the difficulties with these fish is how small the nests are. Uh, the smoky mad toms may lay 30 to 50 eggs. The yellowfin mad toms nests are a little bit larger. They're a little bit bigger in size, but you're only talking 75 to 125 or 150 eggs in each nest. So a lot of our work in the early days and still continuing is bringing nests in from the wild and raising those eggs and young in our hatchery and then releasing them to streams where we want to restore fish. Um, usually when we do that, we'll put a portion of the fish back to the origin stream so we're not negatively affecting those source populations. But uh, these fish are primarily nocturnal, nocturnal, so we spend a lot of time snorkeling around at night with flashlights uh, trying to capture them. Because they're so rare and so sensitive, we're very careful in how we handle them. Um, all of these fish are caught by hand with little aquarium dip nets uh, so that they're not exposed to electricity or chemicals or handled too roughly. Um, I keep talking about mad toms, but mad toms are cavity nesters. And I talked earlier about silt being a problem for a lot of these fish. 
Well, this is a flower pot, which is nice and handy for us to deal with. Uh, in the most most cases, these guys would be nesting under slab rocks or even wood. We've seen them in uh, aluminum cans and bottles, which is kind of amazing. Any cavity they can find in the river, they'll nest in. But it's important that they have enough um, clean substrate around their nest and their nest doesn't get smothered by silt. So siltation is a real problem for these fishes. This is the Carolina Mad Tom, and I put him in because this is the first fish that we've been able, first Mad Tom catfish that we've been able to reliably spawn and reproduce in our hatchery. So that's kind of a success for us. We don't have to bring in nests from the wild. We're able to raise many, many Carolina Mad Toms in our hatchery. Um, a few Virginia fish. So we've talked about some of the fish we work with. We've done a lot of work with Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources over the years. They've been a great partner, the Fish and Wildlife Service folks in Virginia. Uh, this is one of the fish we work with, the dusky tail darter. Again, they spawn under rocks. Um, if you look at his dorsal fin here, you'll see these little golden knobs. Uh, that's an interesting adaptation they're actually called egg mimics. So this is a clutch of eggs that a dusky tail darter laid on the ceiling of that nest rock. So he'll lay there with his egg mimics kind of exposed, enticing a female to come in and lay eggs. It uh, gives her the impression that he's already successfully spawned and has a clutch of eggs that he's taking care of. So we see some really cool parental care in these fishes. The males will stay with the nests until all of the fish have hatched and dispersed, which is really amazing. So how do we learn about these things? Uh, lots of time face down in the water. <laughs> we spend hours and hours snorkeling, uh, observing these fish, uh, looking for where they're spawning, what conditions they're staying in when they're not in the spawning season so that we can reproduce those in the hatchery. And, uh, successfully rear these really, really rare animals. So lots of time in the stream. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the hatchery doing research. Um, one of the things that we thought we knew about darters, which live on the bottom of the river and dart around, as the name implies, on the bottom live under rocks, is that they always live under rocks. Well, what we found out is that they don't always live under rocks. The larvae, and I wish I had a picture, but they're so small, it's really hard to see, actually swim up near the surface of the river or the stream that they're in. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Uh, that's where there's a lot more food availability. The water's a little bit warmer where it's worn by the sun. So you've got algae, a lot of microcrustaceans. Uh, some of these fish are actually picking pollen off of the surface of the water. So when we found out that these fish were swimming around or up to a month sometimes, it really changed how we dealt with the fish and what we needed to do to take care of them in the hatchery. So because they swim up near the surface and they're smaller than the outflow of the tanks, uh, this is the surface of the water and kind of a drain that goes down to a central sump. Um, the fish were going over the drain. Well, they're extremely delicate when they're little, so we decided to take advantage of them getting sucked through the drain and have them come down a pipe and into a catch basin. So we can capture the fish after they hatch because they're swimming around at the surface without ever handling them. And then we put in a white slate because they're almost transparent. And the only way you can see them is against a white background. We'll see them swimming around against the white background, slurp them up with a turkey baster, which is one of our favorite tools in the hatchery and dump them into a rearing tub where they'll swim around for up to a month um, feeding and maturing to the point where they eventually transform and drop down to the bottom of the tub and act like a darter should act, in our opinion. A uh, little bit about Virginia fish. Uh, you guys have some of the most amazing fish out there. Uh, this is the Roanoke log perch that I think you're familiar with. Uh, one of Joel Sartori's photographs, uh, this fish is on the endangered species stamp set. 
as is the candy darter. Uh, Virginia got two fishes and Tennessee didn't get any. We'll need to talk to them about the next run of endangered species stamps. But uh, this fish is fairly narrowly distributed in the state and it's uncommon wherever it's found and it's subject to a lot of impacts. Um, you can see this sharp line here at the state line Fish don't respect state lines. Uh, they like watersheds and river sheds. So this is a little bit more representative of the distribution down into North Carolina. But there's a big gap here in the Mayo River system. Uh, this fish has been eliminated in both Virginia and North Carolina from that system. So we're working with North Carolina to reintroduce Roanoke log perch in North Carolina with the expectation that eventually they'll swim upriver into these reaches that are in Virginia. So this is a species that we've worked with for several years. Uh, they're a huge darter, which means they're maybe seven or eight inches long. Again, these are all small, non-game, but very, very important fish that we work with. This one I put in, we haven't worked with it. We would love to work with it, but it is probably one of the most beautiful fish in North America, the candy darter. Um, it's restricted to the Gully, Greenbrier, and New River system in Virginia and West Virginia. Um, I made the map small because I wanted a big, pretty fish picture. But you can see this yellow and red is where the fish has been eliminated. The red are barriers to fish movement. The green is the only area where this fish still occurs. And that's a problem. Uh, it needs to be put back into some of these areas and impacts where it actually still lives need to be avoided or minimized or, or mitigated in some way. Uh, these guys have another problem in that in the lower Gali River, the variegate darter, Ethiosma variatum, has been introduced. It's a closely related species and it's hybridizing with the candy darters. So the candy darters are in trouble because of loss of habitat, historic coal mining and other impacts, dams, as you can see on the map. But it's also being changed as a species by crossbreeding with another closely related species. Um, this is one that we've actually put in a proposal with Virginia last year, uh, not funded, but we're gonna keep trying because we think this fish is well worth saving wherever we can work with it. Um, I don't want you to think that you guys have the prettiest fish. <laughs> These are two of our favorites that we work with, the blue mass darter, uh, only in the Caney Fork River in Tennessee, and the tangerine darter. These are another big bodied persina darter that's uncommon throughout its range, much like Roanoke log perch, but we can keep this fish off of the endangered species list by working with it. The blue mass darter is extremely restricted and we are trying to restore it to one of only four rivers where it was historically known. And I'm looking at the time. So over the years, we've worked with 83 fishes. Uh, we've released almost 275,000 fish, which doesn't sound like a lot if you're a trout hatchery, but it's a lot for us. <laughs> and we've worked in 15 states. Um, and I will leave you with the next generation because we have done a lot of work, we'll continue to do a lot of work, but we need new conservationists to come along and help us out. And that's uh, that's all I have. I'm gonna run you to the thank you. Please visit our website. We're a nonprofit like Wild Virginia. If you'd like to donate to our mission, visit us at conservationfisheries.org. Do follow us at Conservation Fisheries on Instagram. Um, the people that we have working for us have an amazing social media presence. They post videos and photos and information about the work we do and the importance of our mission uh, every every day. Amazing. Thank you so much. Personally, also very interesting for me too. Um, this was just such a really fascinating talk. Um, we do have some questions for you in the Q&A and I will read them out for you. Um, nice. So we have one from Win Winfrey, and he says, what is the blue fish which has a 
useful fin similar to a grayling. I think it was on how you restore rare species slide. Oh, the bluefish. Yeah. Um, I think I stopped sharing my screen. That the bright blue ones are probably the worst named freshwater fish in North America. The common name is the spot fin chub. Uh, that's a fish that actually occurs in Virginia, uh, in the North Fork Olson River in Virginia. But uh, that's one of our favorites just because of how spectacular they are. Those are two males fighting over a spawning spot. <laughs> wow, yeah, they are incredible. I think I, I need to know more about the fish in Virginia. They really are beautiful. Um, okay. And then Wynn also is asking, so he says, my home river is Cowpasture River in Bath County, Virginia. It has remained remarkably unchanged since I began fishing, fishing it 66 years ago, except that there seems to be a decrease in freshwater mussels. And I know you talked a little bit about this. Um, if you do know about Cash, Cowpasture River or any other ridge, rivers, is this something that's happening, like our freshwater mussels decreasing? Yeah. Um, and what other rivers maybe are you aware of? Yeah, I don't know in particular about the cow pasture, but I know that that's kind of been the pattern for freshwater mussels uh, across the southeast. Um, I mentioned the host fish requirement. A lot of these mussels are really long lived, decades, uh, maybe even centuries. They've, they've found some of them that are 90 or 100 years old. So those fish, if they don't have the right I'm sorry, those mussels, if they don't have the right host fish present in the stream, will survive and they'll just age out and die old age. So what we're seeing with a lot of these populations is the fish that are required for part of their life cycle are eliminated. The mussels just live decades longer before they pass away. So they're kind of a retirement home for those mussels. So that may be the phenomenon you're seeing in the cow pasture. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we have a um, another question from Jess Clatterbuck. She says, "Are there any fish propagation facilities in Virginia?" Uh, not, not like the work that we do with non-game fish. Uh, there, there are state and federal fish hatcheries that kind of dabble in the non-game stuff. But if you think about where the funding where these agencies come from, it's from game licenses. And uh, that, that's where the focus has been. To the state's credit and to the Fish and Wildlife Services system of hatcheries credit, they're starting to work with some of these really rare species. So that's exciting. Great, awesome. And then another question from Jess, she asks, why don't all water treatment plants use ozone over chlorine if it's just as effective and not bad for river health? Is it more expensive or does it have some other downside? That's a good question. I, I'm not uh, a water treatment expert, but I would imagine it's more um, expensive. You have to put in the equipment. Uh, you have to maintain and run the equipment. Uh, we use ultraviolet or we use ultraviolet light and ozone in some cases in our hatchery for sterilization. And it is costly and a maintenance nightmare for us. So I, I would think that that's the argument against using chlorine's easy. You just dump chlorine in and it sterilizes everything. But uh, ozone is as effective and much less impacted on the environment. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question, Jess. That may be something to advocate for, for your own water treatment plants. Um, to, let's see, we have uh, another question uh, from Tristan Tabor. Um, they say, you mentioned chlorine byproduct contamination impacting some of the sensitive species. Do you have base, base flow issues with any contaminants? In the um, uh, Northeast, we are really dealing with chlorides from road salt. Boy, I wish we knew the answer to that. Yeah, um, uh, we we have seen fish kills in our area that we think are attributed to road salt runoff. So um, it, I think that there's a persistent problem with road treatment, uh, particularly as you go further into the snowy areas north of us. We don't get that much snow <laughs> in the Tennessee Valley, uh, but uh, so our treatment is a couple of times a winter, but there are some parts of the country where salt is applied every day to these roads and, and it has to be 
a major impact on those receiving streams from the runoff. Great, yes. And so we don't, does anybody else, any other attendees here have any questions? I have a question of my own, but I wanted to make sure that any attendees get their questions answered. Okay, we have another one from Wynn says, are there significant problems with warming in our freshwater rivers and streams? I think we're beginning to see some of those issues. So a lot of the fish that we work with are spring endemics or live in spring runs near the headwaters of these streams. And we're seeing changes in groundwater temperatures. Um, one of the fish that we work with is the pygmy sunfish. Um, it's about as restricted as any fish in North America. It lives in one spring in North Alabama. And the they've done some studies on um, temperature effects on spawning. And if you raise the temperature of the water that they're in only three or four degrees, they stop spawning. So we're already seeing some groundwater, long-term groundwater trends toward higher groundwater temperatures. And it's definitely gonna affect those really sensitive headwater species. Uh, Dave and I are described that group of animals as probably the most endangered freshwater fishes in North America, those that rely on cold, clean spring water. Yeah, great question. Um, that's great. Do we have any other questions? I don't know if this is a question from Frank, but it says status of Marjanid Mad Tom, my favorite in Shenandoah. I don't know. Do you Mad Tom, that's a good yeah. one. I, I don't know. Uh, I did have <laughs> asked the state fish and game folks. Uh, Mike Pender, <laughs> yeah. Department of Wildlife Resources is the person to go to on that one. That is a great animal. They're beautiful. Awesome. Um, I do have a question because I have worked with uh, raising endangered species for reintroduction, not fish. I did only uh, bird species. But did you see any uh, behavioral issues with the fish that you bred in captivity when they were released back to the wild? Um, when we started, I, I think we did. Um, and it was around diet and behavior. So we, uh, I didn't mention it, but one of our biggest successes is raising live foods to feed these animals. So before we were feeding prepared foods and pellets and things like that, and you're not training that fish to survive in the wild because the food doesn't rain down from above <laughs> when you're in Sitico Creek. So we spent a lot of time developing our ability to grow live foods, Daphne and Syria Daphne, even some shrimp that are almost aquatic insect surrogates. So those fish are not, um, acclimated to tanks, they're pursuing their prey and going after things. So we did see, we think some behavioral issues early on, and we've done a lot of work to try to correct some of that. Great, thank you. That's super interesting to me because we, we saw the same sort of thing when rearing birds in captivity of like we had to give them, if they were a predator species, we had to give them live prey. So really fascinating that it's also seen in fish. Um, we have one more question from David Jenkins says, you mentioned the limited range of the candy darter. Why don't they uh, propagate up and down the stream from their present location? Uh, some of those barriers that I talked about, the dams and the areas below the dams, uh, keep them from dispersing. Uh, there are still legacy mining issues up in that region in the, in the Conowa River. It's uh, It was heavily mined in the past and reclamation was spotty <laughs> in a lot of cases. So there's still some water quality issues, I think, that are keeping that fish from moving back into the rest of its range. The biggest one is the barrier spams. Time for like one or two more questions. Does anybody else in the audience have any questions for our Anybody else questions? I think that's all for the questions. 
So thank you so much, Bo. This was really cool and informative. No, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed talking about our work. Great. Yeah. So with the information that Bo gave you, please do go to their website and see their more information about their organization. Um, yes. And if you have any other questions about the work that we do with endangered species conservation at Wild Virginia, you can email me at jessica at wildvirginia.org. Um, but it was so lovely having you, Bo. Thank you so much to everybody who attended. We really appreciate it. Um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.